Welcome back to the Technology Metal Show. I'm Peter Clausey. As always, we're here with Jack Lifton, critical, me critical metals supply chain expert. Kind of feels like forged in fire. It's Friday, October 30th, no Halloween tomorrow. And we are thrilled to have as our guest today, Mr. Waldo Perez, PhD from Neolithium. Waldo, nice to meet you in uh, what's passing for in person these days. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Uh, nice to meet you guys, Jack. <laughs> and I'm in St. Catharines outside Niagara Falls, Ontario. Jack's in Michigan outside Detroit. And I think you're down in Argentina, right? I am in Mendoza, Argentina, yes. Okay, so let's get right to it. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Neolithium has a very advanced lithium project in Argentina. And just before we went to air, you were telling us about the plateau, 4,000 meters elevation, 60% of the world's uh, salt brines for lithium are there. So tell us more about that, where your project is located. Well, uh, when it comes to lithium, there are two places and two sources. The two places are South America, the Puna Plateau, which is Chile, Bolivia, Argentina, for brine resources. 60% uh, of the lithium of the planet is located in an area that covers this, uh, this plateau. Uh, it's about 4,000 meters elevation. It's about 4,000 kilometers in length. It's about 3,000 kilometers in width. And these are and the Solars, right? The Salt Lakes are the Solars. Yeah. Inside there, you have Solars. And okay. to be very clear, our objective here is to find a liquid, which is a hypersaline brine, that is trapped in rocks, and those rocks are mostly sodium chloride, but there is also sand and another, another type of porous rocks that trap this hypersaline uh, liquid in close basin in the Puna Plateau. So this is actually what the exploration looks like. You explore for a liquid, not a solid, a liquid, okay? And you exploit a liquid that you actually extract using simply pumping technology. That is the same technology that you use in a farm, in a water well, or actually, if you want to go a little bit beyond, in, a, in an oil and gas. Jack, have you been on now, site to a solar? No. no me neither. So, <laughs> no, but I, at one point in the early part of this century, I represented SQM in Detroit. Okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will send you a few pictures, guys. And of course, please visit our website, uh, neolithium.ca. It's, it's a good website, Waldo. Whoever designed it did good yeah. work for you. And actually, you will see plenty of pictures. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very dry area. There is literal no life, like quite literally, I mean it, because the salt actually is, 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 a, is a bad uh, environment for, for, oh, for life. I hadn't even thought of that. So it's not like some yeah. animal has evolved and adapted to be able to live in the solar. Uh, yeah, some did, uh, and they are bacteria, basically. So the only living animal there is a bacteria. And by the way, scientists like to study those bacteria because they think that they can mimic uh, life out of the planet, like literally, like in Mars or in another. Country. So they study those bacteria. And I guess it doesn't interfere with the mining of the lithium in any way? <laughs> no, and they're pretty small. And just as a fun fact, uh, they don't breathe oxygen. They actually live out of the, the exchange of, of, of salt with water. So they don't need oxygen to breathe. Okay, you, know, you know I'm going to have to look that up later now. <laughs> it's a fascinating topic. All right. Now, so you said there's two, uh, two places where they're found. One is in the water. Exactly. And the other exactly. is, One is in, Thunder the Bay, other Ontario. Is, is, is a rock. Uh, it's actually a mineral called spodumen. Uh, and that mineral... It's actually more common in the planet, although the best spodumen in the world is found in Australia. So at the end of the day, there are two sources of lithium. Rocks, which is actually spodumen being mined in Australia, and brine, which is a liquid, which is being mined in Chile and Argentina. Okay. Now, from that, there is also something to consider that you know, is not obvious to the general public. The spodumen can produce hydroxide. Uh, I, uh, there are two uh, final products for lithium. One is lithium hydroxide and the other is lithium carbonate. So both are used in batteries. Lithium hydroxide are used with 
certain type of batteries and carbonate is used in another type of battery. But, but one, is, one of them has a very short shelf life, right? It lasts like 30 days and then yeah. you have to use it or it deteriorates. Well, hydroxide, hydroxide is more uh, subject to deterioration. So that's why, that's why you would see that most of the hydroxide is produced near the battery plants. Just to make a definition, in Australia, people mine spodumen, they ship the raw spodumen into China, and in China, the spodumen is processed and go into a battery. Jack, now, of course, hey, for, hey, sorry, for Jack, the miner... This, this is Jack's area of expertise. Sorry, Waldo. Jack, I see you frowning a no, bit. I, just, I, need, I need to say something because uh, some I don't want our viewers to uh, misunderstand. Uh, here's an old man's story. My very first project uh, as, a, as a chemical engineer, we'll say, was to find uses for lithium. <laughs> I was, I was on a, I had a, I worked in a company, had a contract with, with a company called, uh, us lithium. I think it was in, it was in North Carolina and they were mining spodumene. Yeah. In those days, we never heard of brine. Yeah. So I, I, the, the, the viewing public has to understand that it's only in the last generation that Brian has become, it, it, Waldo, is it the dominant source now of lithium or is spodumene still ahead? Yeah. Okay, okay. Good question, Jack. This is what happened. Uh, North Carolina was the number one producer of lithium, and you probably know why. It was used by the military to yes. uh, separate uh, the lithium-6 uh, isotope right. to build hydrogen bomb. And, yeah. and the problem was, and that's why probably you were hired to look for uses of lithium, is that only like 6% of the lithium isotope using the hydrogen bomb out of the total lithium is, 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 is actually the, the right isotope. So you have like 94% of lithium that you throw into the garbage and then you need somebody to look for, for uses for it. Wow. <laughs> burst any bubbles, uh, but it, it is, as you know, Waldo, it was around 1980 that I think Panasonic introduced the lithium uh, ion battery. I think it was 83, and, 1983, okay. I think, Jack. Well, I can tell you this. My group made a, we made a battery based on, on lithium chemistry in, two, in 1962. And Lithium Corporation of America, I think it was called, the, not U.S., Lithium Corporation of America, they decided that was not a good path to follow. There was no point to it. So just to <laughs> show, I've always been on the cusp of technology. And so was North Carolina also the source of the lithium for the medical industry? Well, Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah it was. North Carolina was the main producer uh, back then because it wasn't like, um, again, it was an element that the Russians were looking for because of the of the of the Cold War yeah. to build the hydrogen bomb. The U.S. had uh, that. But what happened is that the Cold War, war went over and then, then, then there was no major uses for lithium. But what happened then was that they discovered that they can use it in glass. And Pyrex found out that if you put it in, in glass and ceramics, you can actually microwave them or put it in the oven. And that was the major issue. The major use of lithium until the year 2006, 2007 was actually the ceramics industry. Get out of here. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So oh. it's only in the last, uh, shall I say, 10 years that the battery uh, first made it to this, to the, to the telephones, okay? And after, after getting into the, the smartphones and so on, it became so ubiquitous and also the technology became so powerful that we we didn't realize, but we started to depend on lithium batteries. Like when you are using a drone, when you are using all those appliances, tools, that, that they're always running out of lithium batteries, all of them. Because among other things, lithium batteries don't have a memory. Do you remember the first cell phones that they, 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 would, they would tell you that you have to plug it in, but then you needed to take the energy out. Remember that, that you need to empty your telephone, otherwise you will kill your battery. <laughs> and that's why, of course, that technology, nickel metal hydride, was totally useless. So we, uh, let's, but, talk, let's talk battery configuration for a second. I was involved in the development of that battery. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in China, we have a company, uh, BYD, who touts a formulation heavy on lithium with like 0.5% cobalt, but not a high energy density. 
do they have any chance of expanding that? No, uh, BYD, uh, as you know, is is one of, is, is one of the largest um, car makers in the world. They sell almost everything in China, and they have a very strong uh, battery. Uh, I mean, electric. I mean, but uh, lithium battery uh, industry. They develop uh, in December 2015 a new uh, LFP battery, which is basically a battery without cobalt, without nickel, that is about 50% of the cost of the other batteries, which are made of hydroxide, uh, and has about 80% of the range and energy density. So it is a great, shall I say, a technological achievement. And nowadays, the Tesla battery, CITL, by the way, it's our partner in our project. The I, large I, want to come back, I want to come back to C, uh, CTL. No yeah. yeah, of course. They actually uh, also created a, a similar battery. So let me put it like that. This battery is the battery for the uh, cheap cars. If you need to make a $25,000 car, Tesla built in China is an LFP battery. LFP battery means it's a carbonate battery. That means has been it has been it, it was made with brine basically. Now instead, the other batteries like um, you know the high density battery that takes cobalt and nickel, they are done with hydroxide, and you could do it from carbonate converting to hydroxide or from spodumen using the hydroxide directly. Okay, so any of the two. Jack. No, I was going to say, look, we're all getting a, a good education on this, but we're not talking about neolithium, all those companies. <laughs> we'll, we'll get back to that because, oh. well, no, because, uh, you know, I like broader settings. There's there's thousands of companies mm -hmm. out there, but how you fit in the universe matters. And, yeah. and neolithium fits in the universe in one way through its relationship with cattle, which is a very large battery manufacturer in China. No, and hmm. as I understand it, they've actually made an equity investment into Neolithium right. and is a shareholder. That's a pretty strong endorsement. This is a very strong endorsement. Um, and we are one of the few companies uh, that has a relationship with a, with a very large battery manufacturer. This is actually validation money. And they are, they are going to sit in our board. So it is very important. Now, our project and was selected by CATL uh, for some very specific reasons. It's the highest grade project in the world. If you go to independent analyst, Roskill, is the lowest capex and the lowest opex, that has the lowest operational cost and the lowest uh, need for capital to build the mine in the entire world. So it's really a, a very important project. It fits in the universe as the number one undeveloped project. Uh, what for is the con typical content in lithium parts per million of your uh, brine? In the first 10 years, our grade will be over 1,000 milligrams per liter. That is in the first 10 years. Uh, we get brine up to 1,400 milligrams per liter, but the average production for the first 10 years is gonna be over a thousand milligrams per liter. And after 35 years of production, we will still be around 790 milligrams per liter, which is higher than current producing mines, okay? Yeah. So the grade of this project is higher grade than some producing mines like coal so and so on. For the technically, so for, for the technically minded, the amended pre-feasibility study on the Quadrobratus project came out May 7, 2019, and is available at the website and lays out all of this technical data. Uh, after yes. tax NPV 8% and a 50% IRR. Yeah, the IRR is amazing. It's actually very difficult uh, to find a mining project with an internal rate of return of 50%, with yeah. a payback of less than two years. And you may wonder, well, how come? You know, how come the numbers are so good? And the answer is the following. A very low operational cost give us very large margins. And a very low need for CapEx to put this project in production, uh, okay, allow us to repay our debt, you know, and be and be out there uh, in money very soon. So this is the secret. Uh, in nature, these two aspects, low 
operational costs and low capital need are usually opposite. <laughs> usually, you need a big capex to act on low operational costs and so on. So it's very rare, it's very rare, but this project is quite unique. This project is not like uh, the other salars. By the way, since 2008, well, well, I have well, been... Stop, hang on, wait, wait. You can't make a statement like that and run away from it. Why is this project unique? Well, there are obviously geological reasons behind that, that we can go in. But again, the chemistry of this project is unique because of the grade. It's extremely high grade and it has very low impurities. When I talk about impurities, I'm not talking about the impurities of the final product, which at the end of the day, your final product is a manufactured product. Uh, I'm talking about the impurities in the ore. In the same way that, for example, if you are, just to say, in the gold business, arsenic uh, is not good because it's toxic and you need to get rid of. So the higher the arsenic, you know, the more problems you have in metallurgy. Uh, for iron, silica is, 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 is except, bad. Except in Nevada where they love their arsenic. <laughs> well, okay. But uh, then, then uh, in zinc, oh. selenium is, is a bad word too. But in lithium, the bad words are magnesium and sulfate. Those two elements sequester the lithium from the brine and basically precipitate in a clay that um, basically is, is, is untreatable. In other words, you can't take the lithium out of that. And that, for that reason, the lower the magnesium and the lower the sulfate, the easier the project is to be get in production. Well, our project happens to be the lowest sulfate and magnesium project in the world has lower contents of magnesium and sulfate than pro current producing mines. And that's why our operational cost is going to be lower than that. And that makes you unique. Go ahead, Jack. I've been hearing for years that the problem with Bolivian uh, brines is that they're too high in magnesium. And yet these brines are all interconnected, are they not, in, in this region? So how no, 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 they are not interconnected. No, 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 no. Actually, they are exactly the opposite. They are all not connected. Like, uh, think of them as, as glasses, okay? Think of them like you have a table and one guy has a glass of Coke, the other has a glass of, I don't know, wine, and the other has a glass of whiskey. They are not connected. And actually, the chemistry of each one is different. Now, what controls... The chemistry of the salar. Well, think the salar is actually the lowest part of the plateau, the lowest elevation. So it's, part every, of the so it's everything that's rolled into it. It's a catch basin. Exactly. And every catch it's basin catch is different. Basin. Okay. We call it a garbage can. Because oh. basically, it, it collects everything that is in that basin. So in your basin, for whichever geological reason, you have more magnesium, you have more sulfites end up in the salar. In your basin, there is no those such uh, elements because the rocks around have very low content of that, then you have a different content, okay? So this is what's controlling the salar chemistry, the surrounding ground. Okay, so then I have a related, unrelated question. Earlier today, Jack and I were talking about something called quantum space, which is a solid state battery research that's going into a SPAC in the United States. And their metric is one times cash flow in 2027. Any thoughts on solid state batteries? Well, they they are the future. Uh, solid state batteries is what's coming next. Now, I don't know how long it will take, uh, but uh, this is what's coming next. And and only solid state batteries make a, a, an airplane to fly. And that is going to be the next thing, you know, the revolution. Now we're talking, look, in 2008, 2009, we were talking about the revolution of batteries for this, for phones, for, uh, for laptops, because everything was a lithium battery. Now, in 2020, we are talking on the revolution of lithium for cars, because cars are going to be dominant, dominantly electric. And in 10 years from now, 2030, 35, I hope to be retired, but we will be talking about the lithium in airplanes, and those are going to be solid-state batteries for sure. Yeah, well, it's kind of let me let me break up the love fest by asking you a question you may not <laughs> want to. Ask. Uh, uh, what 
have you determined or, or has has your new investor mentioned uh, what they would like from you? What, you know, the market for uh, battery electric vehicles, no matter what we like to sugarcoat it in the West, is not growing that fast. It's still a minor thing. It really is. I'm in Detroit, and I can tell you that the the number of battery electric vehicles sold in this country in the last year is is maybe three four percent of the number of internal combustion. Okay, it doesn't matter what you think about the future. Uh, we buy our groceries with money we make now. Okay, so my question is. China is way ahead of the world in in uh, this. It's my understanding that the next uh, five-year plan, I believe it's the 14th, uh, which will be issued in a, just a few days, is going to mandate 20% or more of all cars sold in China in 2025 be BEVs, which means a, a dr China will then be the largest market in the world for, for lithium-ion batteries for, for vehicles. Now, what percentage of what you're going to produce do you plan to sell in China versus the rest of the world? I'm just asking because I think it's a regional market, a really regional market. Okay, two two points about your statement. Yes, China is going to be number one, and Europe is going to be number two. Okay. 106 vehicles next year are going to be sold electric, and uh, and the penetration in some countries like. Uh, like uh, Norway, it's actually 70% today. Oh, I understand uh, that. Seven. Remember, uh, I've been course. in the USA. We're always yes. on top. We sometimes have to flip the chart. <laughs> okay? No. So That's true. However, however, the state of California, for example, in the U.S., have put very stringent laws too for uh, for CO2 emissions. So I agree. Uh, the, the, today we are in 3%, 4%. Uh, I personally agree with Roskill prediction that they say that the market is going to be 30% electric, that is 30% of the vehicles of the world are going to be electric uh, by by 2030. So, so when they say yeah, when they say vehicles, do they mean cars, motorcycles, trucks, 18-wheelers, or only cars? Well, they Aldo, I appreciate it, uh, Roskill and all that, but they are just analysts. They use a pencil. You are actually in the business on the ground. What is your opinion of the penetration of, of lithium-ion battery, uh, uh, BEVs, into the marketplace in the next yes. 10 years? The, I, 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 what I was trying to tell you, just to finish my, my sentence, is Roscat is saying that the penetration of electric cars in 2030 is going to be 30%. Elon Musk... Elon Musk is saying that he's going to be double that, just following, just following uh, the terabyte factory. Sorry, the terawatt factory he plans to build in the U.S. Mm. So um, I fully agree that the final number is uncertain. It's very clear that the number is growing, and I have been in this business, uh, lithium. I mean, uh, for over ten years. 12 years, 13 years now, and I, I have seen the growth of uh, the industry. I have seen and I discovered, as I say, Lithium America's uh, Cauchari project. I was the founder of that company, and now that company is in construction. I have seen Orocobre go from discovery to, to construction now. So the industry is clearly maturing. Very clearly, the, it is growing. And today, and this is very important, Today, the market is in equilibrium. So right now, supply and demand are there. Prices, depending technical or battery grade, are somewhere around seven to 10,000. But let me tell you something. In one month in China, the price of lithium increased 17%. That is no minor point. And this is important for the small investor to know because this is coming. And because this is coming, CATL come and does a business with us. Otherwise, what a $60 billion Chinese company want to do having a board of directors in a company like us, which has a $100 million market cap. Okay. Which, which, so brings me then to, which brings me to my next question, Waldo. When are you in production? Yeah, we are scheduled to be in production, uh, having finance next year. 
uh, in the year 2022. So at the end of 2022, if we finance uh, uh, next year, we should be uh, at the end of 2022, that is 2022, 2023, we should be in production, okay? Uh, of course, we still need to complete uh, our deal with CATL. Uh, we, we are, just to have a clear view of what's ahead of us, in the next six months, we will complete our feasibility study. As I say, we do it in conjunction with CATL to have a certification of the final product, which is going to be battery grade lithium carbonate that they can take. And with that, with that, we basically can start construction. So we can start construction next year. And with that, it takes two years to build the mine and basically start production. Okay. okay. Jack? There is, also is there any thought of building batteries in Argentina? No. Look, uh, just as a business for us, honestly, I don't know CATL. CATL oh, have their own plans. <clears throat> Uh, sorry, just generally. I don't mean your company. I mean, is there any movement? In, I, I'll say this: in South America, to to have a domestic uh, battery-powered electric vehicle industry, uh, total uh, domestic. Today, today, BYD is building uh, electric buses in Argentina, as actually the the largest hub for electric buses. Right now, they are importing the batteries. But, uh, but uh, this is very important. And in Brazil, also, uh, there is a plan for a plant to, to start battery. Let me tell you something. South America has a very strong automotive industry. Very strong. Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, Argentina builds almost a million cars a year, and Brazil, like, six million cars a year. Okay. So, so it's big. Let me make a point. I spent many years uh, as an automotive supplier visiting auto plants in Brazil, in Argentina, uh, yeah. so I'm aware of what you're, but yeah. my, uh, the largest Ford plant I ever saw in my life was in Sao Paulo. And, oh, yeah. and so you needed a bus to get from one part to another. And, yes, and so yes. the question is, it seems to me it would make sense for somebody to vertically integrate. You have yes. the materials, you have the, you have the scientists and engineers, you have the, you have the demand. So, so I assume it, look, it, to be an internationalist, I assume the Chinese will do this and that they're already underway. And I Absolutely. assume... Wouldn't it be easier to just to buy one than build one? I'm sorry? Wouldn't it be easier just to buy than build? Like, rather than vertically integrate yourself, have the different industries no, no, and then have yeah. one consolidator. thinking is that maybe CATL is thinking they could make batteries in Argentina. They'll have a supplier locked up of lithium and there's a big market down there. Yeah, I think that eventually, today, to be clear, we, we don't have discussions like that. And, mm -hmm. and very clearly, CATL is a battery business and we are not into the battery business, okay? So it's, it's their business. But, but we will be an important supplier. And something very, very important for us is to consider that CATL, a $60 billion company, has set aside a $2 billion fund to... Um, uh, what they call improve the supply chain of the raw material. And within that $2 billion fund, a very small portion of that is us. And, uh, and, and this is very important. They recognize that this is a supply chain, <laughs> shall I say, uh, need to be improved. And, and think about this. Uh, CATL has double battery production for five years in a row, every year they double production. This is an amazing achievement. This, I think you need to go back in industry, you need to get back to every Ford to see something like that. Doubling production every year for five years in a row. But that means that they are doubling the lithium consumption too. And this is when it comes for us. Believe me, no automotive company, no battery maker want to be in mining. They are different business. Let's get it clear, okay? So when when a, 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 a car manufacturer needs copper, they don't buy a copper mine. They don't need to do that. They, they just go to the market and, and get the best. But they recognize, they know very well that every now and then there is some critical element. <laughs> That's why these are called critical elements that they require to be in production and they also need to be in specs. It's 
not only to be in production, being in production and being specs for them to be able to, to, to produce what they need to produce. Okay. And that is when these Leah sounds work very well. So crystal ball, looking forward, Waldo, what's the next big piece of news coming out of Neolithium? Uh, well, look, um, the next thing that is going to come up very soon is that we close our uh, deal with uh, with CATL. What I mean by closing is that we already signed all the paper, but uh, the Chinese government has to provide the approval of the process, which is a standard procedure. This is going to happen imminently, okay? It's a matter of very short time. So with that, they will incorporate the, the board, uh, the board member, and we will consolidate, we are already working, of course, we will consolidate the technical team, and that technical team will actually go ahead with uh, producing uh, the definitive feasibility study. There's going to be also information about uh, the size that we will produce, because our project is planned to produce 20,000 tons of lithium carbonate per year, but our resource, our reserve, can sustain that for 35 years. So we could also increase the size of the project uh, and we will also be updating our resource reserve estimation because there are uh, resources and reserves that were not included in the previous estimation that was published last year. We have more, more drilling done. So all that is coming together during the next six months along with the final environmental permit, sorry, which is construction permit. So the construction permit comes along with the financing from the from the authorities of the province. So all that is going to be happening in the next uh, six months. And again, with a very important wind tail. Tailwind, you say, eh? Tailwind, tailwind. yes. Wind. Because the lithium prices are increasing significantly. And remember, um, the last time lithium prices increases, it went into a frenzy of lithium. And right now we are in the, we were a front runner into this race with a very strong financial partner, with a pre feasibility finish that proved that it's the best project in the world for development, and then the final feasibility coming along with our financial partner. So we are going to be the next major lithium producer. There is no questions about that. If you were to be producing lithium in 2022 and prices do not go up, Will you be profitable? Based on will, I, hang on, rephrase the question. Profits is accounting with g and and allocations. Will you be cash flow positive? Yes, okay. Let's put it like that. I will be producing at $3,000 a ton, less than that, and I will be selling today at a grade $10,000 a ton. Okay. So I am extremely profitable today. As a matter of fact, I can even play the game. Shall I be too much? to lower prices and send the others to bankruptcy. So, what so I mean... Today, the price that SQM is producing at in, in neighboring Chile. Well, oops. They sell in Europe uh, their product uh, somewhere around $9,500 a ton. Their cost, their cost. Oh, for them. They don't publish, but they are quoted. They are quoted to be, uh, by, again, analysts and Roskill and so on, around $3,200, so similar to ours. Okay. You will be comparable to today's lowest cost producer, is what I'm saying, or even better. Sorry, sorry? They are today's lowest cost volume producer of lithium. You're saying you will be at least that good, maybe better. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. And by the way, we have less taxes than they, they have. They have a very severe taxation in Chile, and we yeah. have a much easier taxation in Argentina. So, from the pure cost, we're going to be similar, and I'm hoping a little bit, but, but it's irrelevant. A little bit doesn't matter. So, it's really rounding error, say. But but uh, from taxation, it's, 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 it's a significant difference. It's much cheaper in Argentina. Okay. okay. Good. All right, guys. Final thoughts. We've been doing this for about 40 minutes. I've learned a lot, and it's been fun. I haven't had to wear my mask. I picked up I picked up a mask that reads, it's going to be okay. And it is going to be okay. Someday we'll all be in the same room. <laughs> of course. I got done speaking extemporaneously for an hour and a quarter, 10 miles from here. So the, the air in my area is quite warm. <laughs> <laughs> well, gentlemen, it's been great speaking to both of you. I did learn a lot. I do think from my perspective 
that uh, neolithium is undervalued in the market. And mm -hmm. it's a story that needs to be told loudly and broadly. Yeah. So, Waldo, congratulations. This is just the yeah. latest in a long string of achievements in the mining world. I look forward to you getting thumped into the Mining Hall of Fame someday. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to get to people. And uh, visit our website, you know, neolithium.ca. There is a lot of more information there. We are in all the social media, too. Uh, because we want to see how you're progressing. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I will be here. Excellent. Thank you very much.